in this computer. Okay, good morning, good morning, everybody. Everybody live, everybody on Zoom. Today, we are going to be jumping into the wonderful world of Zillow contracts. Yes, did I say that out loud? God, how scary. So what is happening for anybody who has any questions or hasn't noticed, but Zillow has purchased properties, right? Uh, make me an offer kind of a situation where they're going in and buying these properties. And then they're working with agents like Veronica Figueroa, who is with EXP, and she is exclusively representing a lot of their contracts. Now, we've seen... Um, for example, with Veronica's, Bruno, you're on, correct? Bruno, you did a deal with Veronica. I don't know if it's still in process. No, um, they picked somebody else. So <laughs> it, was not a, it was not a pleasant situation, <laughs> just to be honest. The whole thing is really bizarre, if you ask me. Um, but what has happened is that there are, she was doing a regular, was it 3% commission, do you know? It was a 3% commission. Okay, but I have seen now two times in the MLS where it has been a Zillow owner and they're offering the co-broke of a dollar. So I don't know if this is a joke or if they're trying to see if they can tempt people to show a property to prove that you won't show a property unless you make money. I don't really know what their game is there, but I just want you to know that is out there as well. And um, I just think uh, it's interesting to see who's doing that. Uh, who is actually has the gall to list as a co-broke of a dollar. But it doesn't seem that it's Zillow because if it were Zillow, why wouldn't he do the same, the same thing with Veronica Figaro, right? So with that said, when you get into contract uh, with, with um, this situation of a Zillow, there's two things. One, you have to put the offer in on this contract. They will not accept any other contract. And number two, you'll have to do the seller's disclosure. They have three things that are there, a proof of funds or a pre-approval. Those are the three items that you will need to submit when you submit your offer. Not too terribly different, except for this. This is extremely different. And the biggest thing is, guys, there's no, none of our even addendums would work with this, right? Because an addendum is specific to a type of contract, right? So I'm always telling you, if you're using a far bar contract, don't use a crisp addendum. Well, this is neither. This is a Zillow contract. I don't know what attorneys they got to, to do this, but so it does make things a little bit odd. So we really got to learn and understand what it is that our customer is going to be getting into. And as if you see here, we have, let's just admit all these people. Uh, we have, how many pages in this contract? 25 pages in this contract, guys. Is it a builder contract? Dear God, right? This is crazy nice. So we're gonna break it down piece by piece and kind of go through some of the differences, all right? And, and anyone who has a question, stop me and ask me, hop on, you know, come off the mute. Um, it's really important we understand this because if you get this, we all know in this multiple offer crazy scenario, we have to put these offers in really quick with buyers, right? So it's really important that we uh, feel comfortable with these contracts so we don't want to start kind of wondering, should we even put this contract in? We have to understand the ins and outs of the contract before we get in that situation. So um, a couple things, hey Jennifer, that you have here today um, that are new. The beginning part is very, very similar. So basically they're saying who the buyer and seller is, right? And the title and closing agent, this is interesting. It states here that the, um, the buyer is not required to use their closing agent. So the buyer may select their own closing agent. So they can use a different closing agent for title and closing services, but they have to make the request to the seller by inserting their preference in section 9.18. So pretty weird, right? They're probably gonna have something here, I imagine that would come to you, but you can then request in this section 9.18, which we can jump down and take a peek at it, that you wanna have a different closing person. So here we go, nine. Yeah, this is so long. Here it is. Under additional terms, this is where you could write in, buyer is requesting to use celebration title to be the closing agent and escrow agent. And that's where you would put that in. Okay, any questions on that? Totally a new interesting thing. It's, it's crazy. Okay, so they're letting you know that this is a fee simple property and you have to put the number, that's what they're looking for. And uh, this is the legal description that they want here. They don't say that, but the parcel ID goes here and this is the description of the fee simple. So you would put the legal description. They're telling you, this is interesting, 
that all structures and improvements go with the property. Now they list the basics, lighting, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, air conditioning, but what they don't talk about a refrigerator, washer and dryer, like they don't, washer and dryer, they don't even reference that. So great question, is it included? Uh, I'm not really sure. So something that I would definitely, if I were representing a buyer, would ask the selling, the listing agent, is the washer and dryer included? Are all the appliances included? Because this doesn't actually state that. It says all, again, lighting fixtures, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, air conditioning, and other systems or fixtures as attached. But remember, your well, a refrigerator is not attached. It's plugged in, right? So with that said, is it included? I mean, we don't know. So this contract, although it is forever long, to me is very insufficient. Um, now, this is very interesting here. They talk about the fact that, of course, they have their own deadlocks, deadbolts. I don't know if they're not using Supra. Um, Bruno, do you know if Veronica was using the Supra box for her listing? Did you happen to show the property? Mr. Bruno. Okay. Well, maybe he. Sorry, I was looking for my unmute button. Okay. No, I didn't show that. My uh, the buyer uh, just got in with the automated system that they have. Okay, so they have an automated system, and they're letting you know that that automated system, anything that they're going to use for showing, uh, stays with the, it does not convey with the property. It goes back to the seller. So that's what they're stating here. So except for this electronic deadbolt lock if applicable, smart home equipment, this is interesting, attached to real property for the purposes of showing uh, those things would stay, they will not be conveyed to the purchaser. So a cellular hub or motion sensors shall not be conveyed to the buyer at closing. So if there's like a video monitoring system, it clearly states here, it's not gonna convey. So you have to understand that. Now, again, we don't know if a refrigerator or washer dryer can make, but we know that video motion sensors will not convey. Uh-huh. Now, unless, um, question? Oh, what? Hey. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. All right. So the other thing that they're saying, unless otherwise, uh, and uh, will otherwise removed or, and remain the pro personal property of the seller. So that's again about the motion sensors, the um, anything cellular hub that they have in a smart home, anything that they're using for showing that is remaining. But it says, notwithstanding, the seller agrees to convey identified smart home equipment that is set forth below. So if there was something that you wanted to have included, you could then write it here, equipment conveyed, which is pretty weird. Now, again, this is equipment. So this would this be washer and dryer? No, that's not what they're asking for here. They're asking for smart home equipment that would be conveyed. So maybe they're talking about, you know, the Nest system or if the thermostat, which is, you know, a smart thermostat. These are things that you would have to write in this box here. But again, we still haven't even addressed the obvious like a washer and dryer. So my suggestion is be very aware of this when you're showing this property and you're ready to put in an offer, make sure you ask that question. Also look in the MLS. Um, the problem is we can't, you know, a lot of times we can include that MLS synopsis, the broker synopsis, right? If we check the box, we include it and incorporate it with the contract. You can't do that on this contract. We can't incorporate anything into this contract, but we certainly could have our buyers sell it. We can try to get them to sign that. They probably won't, but it may help us, but it doesn't say anything about additional items that are listed in the MLS that they will be included to convey. They don't talk about that. Okay, now this is interesting how they break up the money. Actually kind of clear, to be honest, the purchase price. What is it? Is it cash, conventional VA or other, which could be USDA, maybe a portfolio loan, whatever that is, right? This is weird. You got to be really ready for this one, the effective date. Okay, we are used to what the effective date is, right? When all parties have signed and it's delivered, if it's delivered on Thursday at you know 11.59 p.m., then Thursday is the effective date, right? That is not the case in this contract. Yes, this is a weird one. So what they're saying, the effective date is the later, whatever happens last, either the date the buyers and seller have signed the agreement or the date that the fully executed agreement has been received by the seller. So they're trying to say that if people just sign it, it's effective. 
which mm. really is against licensure law because it has to be signed and delivered. So I'm totally at a loss. I really don't know how we would construe what the actual effective yeah. date would be because it's whatever happens last. So you have your buyers sign it, they sign it, you don't have it yet delivered to you, the buyers change their mind, but sorry, you're in a contract already. Right now in this yes. market, we're not really worried about that, right? Because we're all just trying to get the offer in because there's like 50 of them behind it. But when our market starts to turn and it becomes a little bit more normal, this could be a huge thing. You know, if your buyer's like, yes, I'm excited, I put in an offer and we don't have it back. But, you know, they can consider it effective. So we want to be really careful and get some clarification on this effective date. This is very weird. Any questions cool. about that, though? So it's whatever happens last. Yeah. They all signed it or it's been fully executed and received by the seller. They don't even say that the buyer has to get it, right? They're not even saying which is like ridiculous because all parties are supposed to receive it to be considered. So could this be, of course, in the court of law, would it would it stand? In my opinion, no, but let's hope that we don't have to get there. Okay, closings. Um, it shall occur here. They're talking about the closing um, through the closing agent on or before. I love that. That goes against everything that the legal team has always told us. They're giving you an honor before date for closing date. Go figure. So, but just so you, mm -hmm. you get around this thing. I have no idea. How did they get around this? Um, that's a great question. I mean, the sellers, I, I'm assured that they probably had this written up by an attorney. I'm assuming that they had an attorney who they're using the same contract probably nationally. Right. Because contract law is different in every state. To me, we already just pointed out how many things that are against our law right here. So I don't really know. Um, I was actually thinking that very question. I wonder if the legal team has even looked at this. So that was something that I was going to follow suit with to say, are you aware of this contract? And listen, builders use their own contracts though right? Builders use their own contracts. So they could maybe have some sort of an opportunity because they're a seller that maybe could, could be construed like a developer sort of a thing that they get to do their own contracts. I don't really know. So there well, you have it. I'm sorry for interrupting. <laughs> no, no. I didn't see an expiration date also. <laughs> Neither have I. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of things I haven't seen in here, Bruno. A lot of really weird, ambiguous things. Okay. Now here, um, let's continue on because there's so much to cover here. They're letting you know that the closing date shall not be extended as a result of the buyer failing to comply with any agreement of this provision, which includes buyer's obligations to timely sign any loan documents so that the buyer's lender is able to deliver the remaining balance. So this is a question. Are they trying to make that diligent effort? Are they trying to say if they don't use diligent effort, then they don't extend the closing date and your financing contingency? Like this is another thing. This whole financing contingency thing is a mess here. So you have to be very clear to your customer. If they choose to go with this home and this contract, they have to be on top. If the lender says, give me this document and they don't and they need to get an extension, they won't and they'll keep their money. It's very clear here. They're also saying if the buyer does not complete the sale on the closing date due to buyer's failure to comply uh, with this agreement, buyer will be in breach of the agreement, canceling and entitling the seller to the deposit. Now, all parties are free to negotiate with a written, uh, executing a written closing date extension. So- Free to negotiate- I know. So they're saying that you're in default, but you can still negotiate, yes. right? So this is very ambiguous language. I mean, Mr. Bruno, you're an attorney in Brazil. I know your laws are different there, but is it me? I mean, this is so ambiguous, this whole well, contract. You don't need a, a contract to tell you that you can negotiate. <laughs> That's obvious. No, It's, it's ridiculous. The whole thing is ridiculous. Now you come up to an agreement, so... Uh, Kind of now, bad. they also say if the designated closing date fails, falls on a date that is not a business date, it'll go ahead and be extended to the next business day. So that's good. Sometimes you write in there like a Sunday or a Saturday, you don't think about it. So they're just, at least that they've written that in there, that it will extend to say Monday. And in here, although they don't really lay out time very clearly, but they're, when they do talk about things continuing on, it's to 5 p.m. So I would... I hate to assume, but so far, everything that I've seen has indicated they're considering the business day to end at 5 p.m. like our contracts. 
So that's something at least we're used to. Okay, then it breaks down the deposit. So here's the amount of money that represents the earnest money within three business days. So here we go. Time is different, right? Ours are not business days. Our contract is calendar oh. days. Here in theirs, it is three business days. They must deposit the funds with the escrow agent. Totally confusing. My recommendation is if you're using this contract during cal uh, calendar days, you will always be ahead. You know, you'll either be on time or ahead. If you think business days and you get confused and then you use business days on a regular contract, now we're in trouble, right? So in my opinion, even though, yes, it says business days very clearly, if you imagine just to keep timelines of a calendar day, you'll do better. Uh, closing funds means funds wired or transferred acceptables that is going to be dispersed mm -hmm. immediately, right? So that means what? No checks, a check, you know, if a company says, oh, yeah, we'll take a personal check, that's not funds that can be dispersed immediately. Right. They're not going to consider those funds for deposit. So I would definitely suggest if you're working with a customer, make sure that they wire that escrow funds or bring a certified cashier's check, but do not write a personal check. I mean, we've talked about that before. That could be construed as defaults, right? But here they're being very clear about it. It's going to be default. I mean, whether they want to cancel it or not, we don't know, but we just want to make sure we are understanding what they're trying to lay out here. Um, obviously, we know an escrow account has been established with the closing agent with respect to the property. Again, who is the closing agent? Eh, we don't know, but you can select your own. Additional financial terms. <clears throat> so these financial terms will supersede any inconsistencies. The fact that they have to state that really makes me wonder, right? Who wrote this thing? But, um, and so it supersede any inconsistency set forth in schedule one which we already went through and state of the state addendum to the real estate purchase so they're considering this almost as if it is an add-on to the purchase agreement which is again bizarre which is this is supposed to be the purchase agreement. this is the purchase agreement that is yes completely crazy so the buyer's closing costs they're writing the closing costs on here hoa fees home warranty hey. other costs <laughs> I love that. And total seller concessions, which I doubt there's many on the seller concessions. But what in the world is this other cost thing, right? Like insanity. I don't even know. So are they are they saying that if, if a, a home is for sale by Zillow, mm -hmm. are they mandating that this contract be Yes. So Rafe's question is, are they saying that if a home is for sale with Zillow as a seller, are they mandating this contract to be used? The answer is yes. They say they will not even accept an offer unless it comes on this contract. It must come with three things. This contract, a seller's disclosure sign, and a proof of funds or a proof of um, approval, pre-approval. Yep. Okay. So, so we're not cleared up at all, right? Because this supersedes the initial section. Buyer's closing costs could totally change. We already know that, right? Based upon even prorations, it could change. So I'm not under, understanding. Uh, we never actually have had one of these go through. So I, I really love to see this section being filled in. And since they're considering an addenda, is it that they go back and fill it in later after they work with the closing company? I don't know. I've never seen that either. I, I don't know. So guys, I can't answer that because we've never seen one, but I just want you to be aware that this is what they're adding here. Okay, the purchase price and deposit. So the deposit will be credited to the purchase price, normal, and the remainder of the purchase price and buyer's share of the closing costs, prorations and fees and costs associated with the purchase of the property will be paid in current funds through the escrow at closing. So essentially they're saying all your other fees are due at closing. That's pretty normal. And they're calling that your remaining balance, okay? In the event that this agreement is properly terminated in accordance with the terms, the deposit shall be delivered to the appropriate party. Notice they're not saying who it is, right? Because it depends on this agreement if they've kept in time with, for example, if the buyer did not keep in time getting the documents to the lender, although, they don't really say due diligent, diligent effort or any of that language. They did say if they don't do that, they're going to lose their deposit. So it wasn't very clear, but this is what I would suggest to your buyer. Make sure that they're following all the timelines. We would probably call that section more of a diligent effort because they would go after their deposits. 
Buyer's conditions. This is interesting. Buyer is obligated to purchase a property and shall be expressly conditioned upon fulfilling each of these. So this is normal. They need insurance, right? And they have to give the insurance to the, to the closing agent and it's due upon the payment of the regularly scheduled premium, the title company, the title insurance policy. So like everywhere else, you have to have the title insurance policy before you can close. That's normal. The delivery performance of by the seller, so that's Zillow, of all documents and closing items required. So that's good. At least they're putting in a little bit that they have to bring everything they need. Um, and then seller has performed and observed all material respects, covenants, and agreements set forth in this agreement and observed by seller at the closing date. So again, if they have stated that something needed to be fixed, they agreed to fix it, you must be able to do that by the closing date. So again, this language is very loose, but it does seem that they're making the seller somewhat responsible to do the obligations that they've agreed upon. That's good. Contingencies, this is really weird. This agreement is subject to the following contingencies. So you have to mark it if it's a financing contingency, if it's an appraisal and or a sale contingency. So that would be a home, a home to sell contingency. Okay. Those are the only contingencies there's allowing. So forget about a 1031 like on exchange. What if it's a FERPTA? Won't be because it's Zillow. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, definitely don't ask for, you know, Obviously, pre-occupancy, not going to be an option. These are the three things you got. Okay. Examination of title is very uh, similar. Basically, the buyer is agreeing to accept the title. But once they've received the report from the closing company, if there's an issue with the title, then they have to write in writing to the seller that there's a deficiency. The seller then has five days, like in our contracts, to cure that. And then they get back to the buyer and the buyer has to accept it. So see, the seller shall have five business days um, after. Um, and if they do not timely improve it, then the buyer has to provide an objection notice to the title report. So, and this also pertains to HOA. So if there's a, for example, litigation within the HOA, all of that is covered under this section. So if the buyer has not, let's say you find out there's litigation within the HOA and they submit that litigation information to the buyer, the buyer says, well, I do not agree with this. I support with the buyer's objection notice. Then they have five days to fix this. If they can't come to terms, because maybe it's an HOA situation where the litigation is not going to end anytime soon. According to this, it seems that they're going to let the buyer cancel and the buyer get their money back. But I would say that this section, again, is a little bit loose. So be very aware when you're helping your buyer buy this process that, you know, property that's owned by Zillow, if there is any HOA or any situations like that, be on top of it. I would definitely say be ahead of it. I'm just going to not show my house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not available, that one, sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Now, this is weird. This is pretty much like an as-is contract, their inspection period, Okay. So the buyer has until here's here's where I got the 5 p.m. The 5 p.m. in the jurisdiction where the property is located on uh, by such and such a date. And if it's not filled in, which I'm surprised they did that, you give 10 days inspection. That's what they're doing. It's an automatic 10 day, not a 15 day, but you could put a date in here. And and then that lets you know, and that's, of course, from the effective date, which, remember, is the later of when either buyer and seller have signed it's totally wrong or when the seller has received the document okay we still don't know about the buyer but you know we may not even have the documents at that point but it's still an executed contract that's the effective date and you will have either 10 days if this was blank or whatever date you write in here by 5 p.m on that day but how will they determine when the buyer receives the agreement now when the buyer they don't talk or about the that seller. they don't really care when the buyer receives They're the agreement there. but it's when the seller receives them so if the buyer and seller have signed whatever happens late or the the seller receives the executed contract but let's talk about this the buyer submits an offer right the seller signs it isn't it delivered yeah right so it's for just kind terms, of yeah. per their terms but we don't even have it back exactly yeah. But that starts the effective date. Mm -hmm. And if you have an agent who's really busy and doesn't get you that contract for three days, it doesn't change your effective date according to this agreement, right? Because the effective date was when it was either signed by all parties or also delivered to you, right? <laughs> so here we go. 
Um, seller agrees to provide reasonable access to the property, which is good. So that way they can get in there. Again, if anything happens in the property, the buyer has to pay for it to bring it back to the original. That's the same thing, even in a walkthrough. If they did a walkthrough and they messed something up, the buyer has to pay for that. That's clearly written out in here. They also are saying that they're agreeing to hold the, the seller harmless, including any affiliated entities of any liability claims, injuries, or damages. So if you go to a walkthrough and you're a buyer falls and breaks their leg they can't sue Zillow that's what they're saying in here which is interesting because I haven't quite seen that language in any of our other contracts but yep yeah, there you have that yeah okay so then here it says if prior to the inspection period so if let's say May 31st by 5 p.m if before that the buyer's not satisfied with the condition of the property doesn't say you have to have an inspection, doesn't say it has to be a licensed inspector. It is more like an as is. Then they have to though put in writing that give them written notice to the seller that they're going to terminate this agreement. And then the buyer will get their money back. So that's pretty similar. Now, in what form? Do we give a regular release and cancellation form? Right. Uh, I don't know. I would because that's what we're used to. But again, it doesn't pertain to this contract. So it's pretty weird. Okay, so here we go. Um, that's the inspection period. Sellers, repairs, or obligations. So in the event the buyer and seller negotiate certain repairs or other seller obligations that come out of this inspection to the property, the buyer's obligations to consummate the purchase of the property shall be contingent upon the seller satisfying that. So again, I would make sure that we have this I'm going to get a hairdo. That's great. Yay. Hair time. Okay. I would make sure that we would go ahead and get this in writing. Again, what addendums do we use? I would use a blank addendum because it doesn't really necessarily make it very pertinent to what contract you're using. But again, this is a weird thing. This hurts. So you have to make sure, and it doesn't say this expressly here, but I would definitely make sure that any negotiations that are happening, just like in an as is, let's say there's an inspection issue and they agree to give you X, Y, Z, which I don't know if they will, but let's pretend that they did. Make sure you get everything in writing before the end of the inspection period because they're not gonna go a day after. It doesn't say that, but it's more like an as is contract. So I'm gonna guarantee that that's probably what would happen. So since this is Zillow, since this is a crazy contract and it's everything on their terms, make sure you stay within the timeline that they set forth. Everybody clear on that? Good so far? Okay, we're, we're rocking and rolling. Listing information, I love this. Okay, again, all it's all on the buyer the buyer has to confirm so if they put something in the listing <laughs> that uh is incorrect they held no responsibility they're saying it's all on the buyer to figure it out if they wrote the wrong school district in there if they if there's a zoning change they're not responsible it's all on the buyer to make sure that the property is suitable for that buyer so make sure that your buyer and yourself representing your buyer knows that and make sure like let's say there's a property behind it that's being rezoned for commercial they don't have to tell you that they don't even have to put it in the mls they don't have to say anything if there's a road that's going to cut through the community they really don't have to tell you that they don't even have to put it in the mls what they do have to do is the buyer has to figure it out and decide and they would decide again during the inspection period. So my point to you is make sure you get all this information, just like an as is before. I, you know, this, this, I mean, this weird, that one weird part with the reliance upon the buyer's own examination. Yeah. That might be enough for the buyer to be like, you know what, I'm out. Well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's like an as is. A buyer can say I'm out for any reason during inspection. That's, right. That's what they're saying here, right? They're not saying that... Um, you know, there's a, the only time frame you have to get out is whatever you wrote down in the inspection period. That's it. And it's up to the buyer for any reason, just like an as is that they can get out. But they're just simply saying, we're not responsible nor liable for the information to be accurate. That's exactly what they're saying. So, you know, oftentimes we'll write in the MLS, you know, these numbers should be, you know, obviously uh, checked by the buyer's agent, blah, blah, blah. This is that on steroids. It's not just the dimensions of the room. Yeah. It's everything pertaining to this property. Okay. Everybody good? 
Okay, so upon mutual execution of this contract, seller may deliver to buyer, may, many say they will, certain reports, summaries, or disclosures provided, pre prepared for the seller in connection with the acquisition of this ownership. So they make no warranty to act any of those reports either. So if they do give you any kind of a warranty about a different product that was in the house or any kind of uh, paperwork about maybe an impending change to zoning or whatever, they're not liable for anything. And the buyer is going to acquire this property. Oh my God. The buyer is going to acquire this property as is and with all faults. So if there's something that they don't like with zoning or suitability of this property, again, all you have is the inspection period. That is it. And you have to make sure that you uh, are letting the buyer know they're not only accepting it as is, they're accepting it with all faults. So if there's pre, like, for example, somebody took a garage and turned it into a bedroom, like we've seen this, we know that's not permitted. If you didn't catch that and decide and make sure that your buyer knew yeah. within that inspection period, guess what? It's not going to matter. They've accepted it not only as is, but with all faults, which means whereas beforehand, you probably could get out of a contract, of course, you need a lawyer. If, for example, we found out there was unpermitted work, it's out of an as-is contract, but if they purchase it, it will definitely affect the value of the, co of the property. Uh, an attorney could then argue that my buyer doesn't have to close because we got this new information and it actually uh, deters from the, the, um, the price of the property, the worth of the property. They're saying here, you can't do that. Right? They've taken that off the table by saying they're accepting it with all the faults. So you better know what the faults are. Everybody good on that? I mean, yeah. as good as we can be, yeah. right? <laughs> Let's be honest. I understand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting because they're talking about um, any kind of liability or claims that come from the comprehensive environmental response. And most people would think, well, what the heck could that be? Guys, if you're buying a lakefront property, that is owned by Zillow. And there is always the conservation area, yeah. right? That goes like if there's a dock, it has to go over that. But let's say it's an old property and they had a beach there. And could the conservation uh, department and the EDP come after the new buyer and say, you've got to fix this and that's going to cost how many thousands upon thousands of dollars because you're going to rip out this beach and you got to add the natural flora, fauna and flora? Yes. And that's what they're letting you know here. You're accepting it as is with all faults. Everybody good? <laughs> Shall we continue? Because we're only on page six, guys, and there's 25. I know. Seller's obligation to sell the property shall be especially conditioned upon the fulfillment of their satisfaction of these following. So they have to deliver and, per and performance of all documents of closing items. So they don't necessarily lay it out, but of course we're assuming it's going to be keys and door openers and you know all of those goodies. The performance and observation by buyer in all material respects, covenants and agreements set forth, observed by the buyer's closing date without limitation to timely paying the deposit and the remaining balance. So essentially they're saying if you had put down which i don't see any spot to put down an additional amount of money but if you did and they were late they could cancel you out and the buyer could lose their money i don't see that really being a, an issue in here just because they never even gave that option to break up your deposit it's either this is the deposit and this is how much you're paying when you close so that's the only good thing proof of funds this is new Within three business days of being requested by the seller, buyer agrees to provide written evidence from a bona fide financial institution of sufficient cash available to complete this purchase. If buyer does not submit this written evidence within three business days, the seller shall have the right to terminate the agreement. If they choose to terminate this agreement, the deposit shall be released to the buyer. So, I don't know, again, because it's only what's in writing, right? Does this mean that day 15, the seller could come to you and say, okay, we want proof of funds now. We want to make sure you still have the cash. And then you have three business days to give them that. And if you don't, they can just cancel. You get your money back. It almost seems to me like it's a cancel for any reason clause, you know, or at least a get out of a closing clause for the seller. Now, I don't know that was the intention of it, but again, with no dates and time frames set within here, right? It doesn't say when the seller could ask for that. So, you know, if the seller has a better backup offer, could the seller use this to potentially get themselves out of a contract? Sounds like 
Sounds like they could. I don't know if that was their intentions again, but because it's such ambiguous language, essentially if they ever ask for written proof and that has to be from a bank uh, or a financial institution showing their actual monies that they have, then you have three business days to get it. And if not, the seller may terminate. And it doesn't say how long the seller has a right to terminate. Does he have to terminate that day? Does he have three days? Does he have five days? We don't know because it doesn't say. Yeah, really weird. Okay, so shall we continue? Condition of title conveyance. Subject to any disclosures, at closing, the seller will convey marketable title. So I like that because that means if there was, for example, a situation where there was a lien on the property, that is not marketable title. So therefore then they can't convey the property. That's similar to regular language we're used to. However, I will say, uh, again, if it's an open permit, that does not affect the marketability of title. So you've already accepted it with all faults. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so they're also letting you know that um, the deed is subject to existing taxes, assessments, reservations, and patents, which is interesting. All easements, rights of way, encumbrances, liens, covenants, conditions, restrictions, obligations, and liabilities, and all other matters of record. So the buyer is advised that the property may be reassessed after closing, which could result in property tax increase or decrease. Yeah, I've never seen that. Title insurance, the seller's obligation to convey marketable title shall be satisfied by the closing agent issuing upon payment of its regularly scheduled premium at the closing, its standard residential owner title policy in the amount of the purchase price as set forth in schedule one of this addendum. The buyer, this is key, shall be responsible to pay for all costs to procure, extend, or additional coverage shall submit any survey required to the issue such coverings. So what's happening is the buyer shall pay for that. The buyer shall pay additionally for the premium for the buyer's lender's policy. So remember when it said you can choose, I highly recommend you do so because if you use their closing company, you're still paying for the, the usual benefits of when you go with theirs, you, you might as well have your own title company and have them hold your money. Does that make sense, guys? So therefore, the, the owner's policy and the lender's policy is being paid for no matter who's selecting the closing company is being paid for by the buyer. Everybody clear on that one? It's a fun one. Okay. Closing requirements. The seller at closing will execute and acknowledge and deliver, oh, it's good that they say that, all documents and any other action reasonably necessary to affect the sale. So they have to give them the deed. They have to give them the homeowners association plan community addendum. That was part of the information they were providing when they were giving you the deed information making sure that it was clear and marketable deed. Any documents the closing agent may require, all keys, garage door openers, right? There you go. The buyer will execute and deliver all documents and take other reasonably necessary actions to purchase a property, including pay or cause the buyer's lender to pay all amounts, right? Required in the agreement of funds. Any documents the title company or closing company agent reasonably requires. So all title costs are going towards the buyer, right? Any loan documents the buyer's lender, if applicable, requires, including proof of homeowner's insurance, to ensure that the closing can occur on the closing date. The buyer shall use best effort to ensure any loan documents are delivered to the closing agent at least two business days prior to closing. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Usually that's on the seller's side, but no. Here the buyer has to make sure that all loan documents, like the buyer controls the lender. Right. So, but it's the buyer's responsibility here to make sure the lender is providing all closing documents to the closing agent at least two business days, business days prior to closing. Guys, how often does that ever happen? Never. Now, here it doesn't say what if that doesn't happen. That's the other thing. So that doesn't happen. And they receive all the documents day of closing. Can they cancel? Does the buyer lose their funds? Like we don't know because it doesn't say. 
Well, I mean, you know, this is very, very vague. Okay. The closing agent will prepare the settlement statement. That's normal. Record the deed. Normal. Deliver the deposit and the remaining balance as appropriate to the seller. Normal. Deliver the title policy to the buyer. Identify and collect all necessary documents from the buyer, the seller, and third parties to facilitate the closing. And deliver the above reference documents to the applicable party. So that's pretty normal. I do find that interesting how they laid out what's going to happen in closing. That's the clearest thing they've talked about. Yeah. Prorations. So this is interesting. All uh, prorations for ad valorem property taxes, community association fees, solid waste and governmental fees for the utility bill, bills that, and services that cannot be terminated as of the closing date will be prorated at closing based upon the actual figures to the extent available. If not available, based upon the most current information on the basis of actual days within the applicable period. So if any appointments or prorations can be calculated accurately based on these figures on the closing date, then they will be calculated based on seller's good faith estimates and will not be reappropriated. The buyer shall be responsible for all prorated fees for the closing date. So it seems as if the closing date is the day they're using for the proration, although it's not very clear but the other thing that's very interesting is that if they don't have like for example there's going to be a homeowners association about <laughs> doing a new roof or something right the seller is going to give you their best guess the seller could be wrong but the buyer is agreeing to it mm -hmm. what it says there that's fabulous. Okay, closing costs. The parties agree to the allocations of the costs set for in Schedule 1, which means what? The buyer pays for all title fees. They pay for the owner's policy and the lender's policy. Mm -hmm. I would feel dirty walking to a closing. <laughs> it's horrible. Blood, blood money. <laughs> yeah, well, buyers are desperate. Don't forget that. Other costs, fees, or expenses not addressed within Section 5 shall be the sole responsibility of the current party. So that is like the ambiguous catch-all. If we forgot something, if it's your job, you have to bring it. Preliminary settlement statement. The buyer and seller will cooperate with each other and the closing agent to prepare the preliminary settlement statement, the basis of real estate taxes and other expenses for the property. Notice what it's not saying, right? It's not saying anything about the CDC requirement of the closing disclosures to have three days. And if the closing documents goes out the day of closing, there's an, you know, in our contracts, there's an extension for up to 10 days. It does not say that here, guys, which means that you better be on top of the lender because if the lender lender cannot close, it doesn't seem to me that they care a bit about the CDC requirements for the no. three-day disclosures because no. mm -hmm. they don't talk about it at all. So if it's not in writing, is it applicable? Great question. Uh, okay. Possession. Buyer shall receive possession of the property at closing. So that's mm. normal. Breach of seller. So this is interesting. If the seller breaches their obligations under this agreement without cause, the buyer's sole remedy all they can do, that's what they're saying, should be to terminate this agreement and receive a return of their deposits. All parties will have no further rights or obligations under this agreement. The buyer waives any right to seek specific performance of the agreement and to pursue any monetary damages. And they said very clearly in the beginning, if this cancels, they are not going to reimburse the buyer for any costs associated like an inspection or an appraisal. So they're being very clear here that the only opportunity a buyer has is to get their money back. If the seller says, for whatever reason, we're not selling, we have a better offer, we don't care about you, the only remedy the buyer has is to get their deposit back. It's like a built-in arbitration agreement inside of a sales contract. It's worse. We're not even agreeing to arbitrate. The buyer's saying, yeah. I have no rights, right? All I'm going to waive all my rights to go for specific performance, to, to sue for damages. Or um, Now, let's be honest. In a litigious society, could you still sell, sue them? Of course you could. But according to this contract, they're waiving all their rights. I would be interested to hear what the far buyer has to say about it. I am very interested, too. Because so ultimately, the contracts are really written to protect buyers, not not yeah, yeah. This, is, this is this, this is written to protect the seller. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Breach by the buyer. buyer. So the funny thing is that was breach of seller, right? The buyer kind of got screwed on that one. Now let's see what happens with the breach of buyer, right? Well, if the buyer breaches their obligations, the seller's sole remedy, okay, shall be to terminate this agreement, retain the deposits as liquidated damages, and upon full payment to in full to the seller of such deposits, the seller will have no further rights, claims, or obligations. 
except those obligations that survive termination. The parties agree that such liquidated damages are not a penalty of forfeiture, and because it would be difficult to determine actual damages, the deposit reflects a reasonable estimate of damages incurred. So they're essentially saying that they're not going to sue them, but do they actually say that? No, they say out there that they waive all their rights to sue. Here it doesn't say that the buyer, the seller is waiving their rights to sue. They're saying that they're going to agree, probably, the deposits. But let's say, okay, you have uh, three business days from the so-called effective date to, to get the deposit in, right? So let's say in between that time, your buyer changes their mind. Guys, this happens, right? A lot. We've all seen it. So what happens? That's breached by buyer. And even though your buyer doesn't want to buy it, and they're like, well, we never even got a deposit in, they could actually go after the buyer to seek because it says that upon payment of full uh, to the seller of such deposit. So if you've never made a deposit, you still owe it. So be very careful that you put in writing because you would be under your termination period that you would terminate before the three business days under the inspection clause. Is everybody clear on that? Because you have three business days to get the deposit in, make sure you're within those three business days so your buyer's not in default. Because if your buyer's in default of not putting the deposit in, they could go, call that breach of buyer. So even though you have an inspection period, your buyer's in breach of contract. So the seller then can get out of the contract, but the, they can demand the, the deposit uh, from the buyers. Is everybody clear on that? That is not something that is in any of our contracts, but it is definitely clear here. So one more thing, we're going to go over these because these are important. Buyer cannot sue for specific performance. They call that out. They waive all rights for any litigation. All they can do is get their money back. Seller, when the buyer is in breach, the seller can actually, they're saying that they probably won't sue you, but they actually never waive the rights to that. So not super sure. But most importantly, if there's a breach that would constitute not getting your deposit in, you will owe your deposit. Everybody clear? Nice. Crazy. That's horrible. Okay, so now this is a whole brand new section, the Zillow Marketplace. So each party may have voluntary used, voluntarily used this marketplace to access potential investment opportunities hmm. and to be, obtain those certain administrative services specified in the marketplace. The marketplace does not provide, nor does either party have expectation of any real estate agency or brokerage services to be provided through the marketplace or Zillow. Interesting. Wonder where they're coming with that one. I, I feel like they're just setting us up for something more, but that's me. All right. Seller's property disclosure statement. Seller has never occupied the property. To the fullest extent permitted by law, buyer waives any right to receive a completed seller's property disclosure statement as required by the applicable law or custom in which the property is located in. Buyer will accept this statement from, this, from the seller uh, as a form of disclosure and hereby acknowledge that the information contained in that disclosure document constitutes all material information pertaining to the property, which the seller will deliver to the buyer within five business days of the effective date. But remember, that's part of the offer. In addition to the seller's property disclosure statement, the seller will concurrently deliver to the buyer the other disclosure documents identified in the state addendum. That's the one that you get that you have to submit. Buyer shall provide notice of any items disapproved in this disclosure document within the inspection period. If the seller subsequently delivers to the buyer an updated seller property disclosure with new information, the buyer shall have two days, two business days, everything in here is business days, from the date of receiving that additional disclosure to either disapprove or and exercise any rights afforded to the buyer under the inspection period. So again, all of this has to do with the inspection period. Um, the buyer will have an adequate opportunity to conduct an independent investigations of the property and will acquire the property solely on the conduct the conduct of independent investigations of the property and in the basis of and reliance of the buyer's own examination of this information. So what are they saying? We know nothing. We don't have to disclose. Our disclosure is to tell you we've never owned this property and we don't know anything. And you have to accept that. So you can't come back to me and say, well, there was a leak and you should have known there was a leak because when you bought it from the buyer, right? When you bought it from the seller previous, it said on that seller's disclosure, there was a leak. Let's say they forgot to put it on theirs, right? It was your fault 
as a buyer because you should have found that during the inspection period and canceled. Everybody clear about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so here's lead-based paint. So if there's a lead-based paint situation, you would actually check this. And this is really interesting. Um, so if it was before 1978, the seller is going to notify the buyer of this. They're going to provide them the, the risk assessments or inspections, and they're going to provide them a disclosure of the lead-based paint. So basically probably the lead-based paint pamphlet. And then they're going to give the buyer five days after the effective date to return a signed copy of these disclosures to the seller. Because remember, if they don't, what are they doing? They're accepting the property as is with all faults. Yep. So they talk a little bit about what are some of the problems that lead-based paint could do. And basically, again, the seller has no opportunity other than to disclose it and to give the, the pamphlet. And the buyer has five business days after the effective date to get that signed copy back to the seller. Everybody clear? Mold naturally occurring. That's just a typical mold addendum. Rate on gas, naturally occurring, typical rate on gas. Broker salesperson disclosure. This is fun. The buyer acknowledges that the seller has disclosed that certain affiliates of seller, Zillow, Zillow Homes, and employees of the seller, uh, including Zillow Home Advisors. So does that mean that Zillow has their own agents? It sure does. Yep. Mm -hmm. So all those people who the Zillow agents, their, their Zillow person said, oh, no, we're not going to do that, clearly lied, which we knew. And it says it right here. Um, all real estate licenses in the jurisdiction where the property is located. Certain employees who have real estate licensure under Zillow Homes are authorized to sign the contract documents on behalf of the seller. The buyer acknowledges that neither the seller or its affiliates or its rep represent the buyer. So they're saying that all these people that could be provided in the sale have nothing to do with the buyer. They don't, rec they don't um, represent them, but there are people that are representatives of Zillow that can sign for Zillow for the, as a seller. Okay, miscellaneous headings. The titles and headings of various sections of this agreement are solely for the convenience of reference. So that's interesting. Time, here we go. All times and dates in this agreement are of the essence. That's normal. The computation of time period for this agreement or by law, the day or act of the event which the period of time runs shall be executed on the last day of such a period included, uh, shall be included unless it is not a business day. So it doesn't even say that all dates are business days. We know that because everything we've read has been a business day, but it doesn't state that. And it does tell you, though, if something ends on a holiday or a weekend, it would then move to the next business day. Now, here, does it say that they're constituting that 5 p.m.? No. But the only place where we saw that, where they gave you an opportunity to extend, is to 5 p.m. So I would suggest that probably everything in this contract would be business days. Everything I have seen has been business days and it would end 5 p.m. the next business day or the business day, for example, if the inspection period ended on Monday, it would be Monday by 5 p.m. Okay, so that's a very vague time. Entire agreement amendment. So this amendment agreement and any schedules or addenda attached to this agreement contain all the representations. So basically this is the regular language saying this is all that there is. They're not agreeing to anything outside. Agreement may not be altered or modified except in writing and signed or initiated by buyer and seller. So they make a reference that you can't alter it. However, they're saying you can modify it if all parties sign it. But again, with what? With what addenda? So that's another question. The closing agent, the seller will notify the closing agent of the designation of the escrow agent under this agreement and the obligation to hold to this first the deposit. So remember, in that additional terms, your buyer can, and in my opinion, should select their closing agent since they're paying for it anyway, right? right? Yeah. And this is just the obligations of what the closing agent okay. does. Now here's the fun one. And we have three minutes and we may have to continue this um next week because we're only on page 11 out of 25 um brokerage disclosure so except this is the seller's broker so in the case of bruno's would have been probably veronica figueroa from exp so it would have been an exp uh, acting on behalf of the broker's buyer. So that if it was us, we'd be Premier Sotheby's International Realty. Acting on behalf of the buyer, each 
of buyer and seller represents and warranties that the other party has not retained, engaged, dealt, or cons consulted with any other real estate agent or broker in connection with this transaction. Each of buyer and seller will indemnify, protect, defend, and hold the other party harmless from any claims against any other brokers and finders through the buyer and seller as applicable. So basically what they're talking about is procuring cause. So they're saying that nobody else can enter into this deal once we've named on this contract who the buyers and sellers are, right? Now, again, if someone stole your customer, it doesn't mean that you can't go after it, but they're just simply saying, well, it sounds like they're not going to pay for it. And who would be responsible? The, 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 the listing agent. broker. Yeah, the listing broker would. So if this seems to be the get out of jail free pass. I don't really know. Um, then they're letting you know that each buyer and seller will identify, protect, and hold the other problem harmless for any claims and any way related to the sale of the purchase of this agreement without limitation to broker's fees commissions, attorneys, and other expenses. So again, if someone stole your customer, you had an exclusive right of sale agreement, does this mean that you can't go after and name that other brokerage to try to get the money who would be responsible the listing agent? You could, but they're trying to say you can't. Some of them saying circle the wagons. Hey, this is what she does. Mm -hmm. Even if somebody trying to play for them, right. we're gonna band together. And right, stand. exactly. Any other questions about that? Okay, so again, I would highly, highly suggest if you are working with a buyer and you are going to put in an offer with Zillow, make sure you have a broker buyer agreement. Absolutely. I would make sure you have a broker buyer agreement. Because of that whole weird clause in there, we want to be clear that you are representing the buyer and, uh, and uh, the only thing that can truly do that is a broker buyer agreement. Everybody good on that? Yeah. Yes. All right. Risk of loss is this pretty standard. Should the property be destroyed or, you know, or substantially destroyed? They have to notify the buyer. And at the election of the buyer, they can either terminate this contract and get their money back, or the buyer can go ahead and consummate this agreement and receive in such insurance uh, paid as a claim of loss. I don't recommend doing that, but they can, and they have five business days to make that election. So essentially, God forbid, there's a fire in the house and it's blown up the kitchen, but the rest of the house is okay. The buyer in some crazy moment says, okay, well, they have an insurance policy that's gonna pay for that. We'll close and we'll receive the insurance funds. That's essentially what they're saying. The buyer can do, they have five days, business days to make that election. I highly don't recommend that. It's very hard to get the insurance funds. You know. Plus my question is, is Zillow insuring these homes? right? Because yeah. they just bought it. And they, the other thing is part of the disclosure that you get when you are downloading these documents, it states that Zillow has not hold, owned this home for any, any length of time. They could have just closed on it a week ago. So my question is, I mean, I don't know. How's that insurance policy even looking? I, I don't know. I have no idea. It's almost seems to contradict the earlier uh, part of the agreement where it says that, you know, the buyer can back out. You know, some doesn't need inspection. That ain't gonna. That ain't gonna inspect. Well, that <laughs> this is more like if after inspection period you had ten days and day twenty a fire occurs in the property. God help you. That's really more what this is about. So, but the good news is it does say that the buyer can say, okay, I'm out and get their money back. It does state that. So that's good. Governing law, they have done this, I'm sure, because this is used probably in many different states. This agreement shall be governed by the laws of the state in which the property is located without regard to its choice of law rules, which is weird because if you think about it, they're going against some of the things that are Florida real estate law states. So I don't know, it's pretty weird. Attorney's fees, okay. Well, we're over, guys. So let me go ahead and ask everybody, are you good? If we continue this, we are on page 11. If we continue this next Thursday, is everybody good with that? Yep. 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 Okay, so we will put Zillow part two, page 11. You guys all have this agreement. Have some fun if you care to read it. But honestly, it is... Uh, it is really ambiguous. That's my one thing. If I had to sum up everything I've read so far, it's completely skewed to the seller, not a surprise. And it is very ambiguous as to what the real, uh, I, again, I mean, how could you say, we don't even know if the washer and dryer are included. We have no idea if the refrigerator is coming. It doesn't state that. I would suggest putting it all under additional terms. This home will convey with and write it all out, but it's a, it's a pretty weird one. Additional terms. 
That additional terms box, by the way, is tiny. So you may have yeah. to write really, really small because so far there's a lot of things we got to write in there because they don't know and we don't have much room to do it. All right, guys, well, have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, just so you guys know, my husband's having surgery tomorrow, so I will be out of the office. But if you do need me, you can text me. And uh, obviously not when I'm, you know, at the place where I'm not allowed to use my cell phone, but in other places, I will be able to use my cell phone and probably will be on my email because I'll be bored. So while I'm waiting in the waiting room. So uh, anyway, have a great rest of your day, guys. And uh, on Monday, we are doing uh, Cloud CMA. I will be doing a, a report using the new live feature on Cloud CMA. So anybody who wants to join, that's 10 a.m. Monday. And then again, next Thursday, we'll be doing this. Now, uh, next June 1st and 2nd, the Tuesday, we have a very special special guests coming. We have Christine Newell coming. We have Nikki Blucker, who's in charge of marketing coming. And we have Elise Raymer, our head of um, PR. They are coming and they're going to wanting to meet everybody and tell them all sorts of exciting things. So we're doing two meetings. That's so uh, that's no, the first June, second, first and second, second and third. Hold on. I'll tell you right this second. June 1st, Tuesday will be happening here in Lake Nona at 10. Okay. June 2nd will be happening in Dr. Phillips at 10. So you could go to either one you want, but okay. it will be uh, with again, Christine Newell and Elise Raymer, who's our head of PR. And it will be also with uh, Nikki Luckert, the head of marketing. So you definitely want to be there and they'll love to meet with you and, you know, do sidebars with you, one-on-one -on -one conversation. They'd love to get to know everybody. So hope to see you all there. I'll be sending more information. I just want to let you know. Okay, guys, have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye.